afternoon. Thank you to everyone for coming today to see our college first presentations, which I think are going to be amazing. Um, it's been a really great and hectic and crazy summer here at the Chicago Botanic Garden with Science First and College First. Um, due to the shortened summer schedule of CPS, we decided to run all three programs at one time, um, which has kept me on my toes, but it has also been a lot of fun for the kids. It's great that they've all been here at the same time and are able to interact with each other. Um, I'm going to start by just telling you a little bit about our summer, and then we'll get into the student presentations. So some interesting things are, um, and new things that we've never done before, are with College First, thanks to some generous funding from the Institute for Museum and Library Sciences, we were able to take a field research trip with our College First students. So we started off the year by right away going on a four-day trip together. Um, we went to Michigan to visit the Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. That's in Southwest Michigan, and that's a biological field station slash environmental ed center. Um, the students spent some time there, three days actually, um, but they put a lot into those three days. Um, they carried out, they helped the institute with some uh, research projects that they had been wanting to do but didn't really have the staff to carry out. So the students investigated past land use and how it affects current um, habitat, current quality of the habitat. So they learned about something called a floristic quality assessment. Um, we did lots of quadrat studies and learned to ID tons of plants. We collected lots of data. And um, they actually presented their research and the institute will be using it as a baseline um, when they further study the plots in the future. So in addition to doing research, we had some campfires, we um, got lost on a bus on a lonely dirt road in the dark. <laughs> we had a good time. Everyone left saying they love Michigan, which was cool because that's my home state. Um, and we just, we bonded together as a group because this was the first uh, major thing that we had done together. So we had a great time doing that and um, actually in particular I want to call out Hugh Brown um, who has come all the way from Pierce Cedar Creek on a long drive to Chicago to come see this kid's final presentations. So we just want to welcome you. And his wife Rachel. Um, and he makes an appearance in one of our projects later on, so just so you have some context for who Hugh who is. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, another thing that was new this year at the Garden is we participated in something called the Chicago Summer of Learning, which maybe some of you guys have heard about. All over the city of Chicago this summer, students were involved in um, summer programs at museums, at libraries, at parks, at nonprofit organizations pretty much everywhere, um, doing all kinds of enrichment things during the summer. So not so much sitting on the couch and lots of productive activities. And for all of their hard work, they received digital badges. And um, digital badges are a way of recognizing student achievement and documenting student achievement um, or adult achievement um, learning out of school. So instead of the usual report card, um, students receive a badge, which is digital, so they can carry it with them forever, um, and it has evidence attached to it. So um, the badge they receive today for research will have um, links to the actual presentations that they created, and they'll have that forever, um, or for as long as they want, and they can show it to whomever they want. So um, for our older students who did more substantial presentations, they might end up um, showing that to a college admission officer or to a different selective high school. Some of our eighth graders might be able to use it for high school applications, for jobs, um, for in future internships. So that's been really exciting to be a part of. And I want to start by just showing you two videos that were produced um, by the Chicago Summer of Learning. They came out to the garden and got fit footage of the Science First kids and their, basically what they do day to day. Oh, I <laughs> yeah, we're showing that. <laughs> the movies actually came out great. Um, and so the garden was one of the highlights of the summer of the citywide initiative. So we just want to show it off and show off the kids. You guys, most of you saw on the Esplanade the great work that the Science First kids did here over the summer. And this will just um, give you a little more clue to that.
For time's sake, we'll just show that one. But that gives you an idea of the kind of work that Science First here did over the summer. Our other group didn't uh, make the video cut, but they also did some amazing things studying <laughs> food systems. <laughs> the other Science First group. Um, <laughs> studying food systems, and I'm sure you guys saw some of that out on the Esplanade. If you want to just go back to them. So, speaking of Science First, um, this was also an interesting year because we had all brand new Science First teachers, and I just want to give a big shout out to them because they did an amazing job. <laughs> an amazing job with the students. Um, didn't have much time to prepare, but jumped right in and had every day everyone on their toes. Um, and so the, those people are Damaris, Quinn, Will, Beatrice, and our assistants, Marlene and Gabby. Okay, so on to College First. College First, of course, also has amazing teachers. Uh, those teachers are Ben Durham and Steve Paglia, who's new this year. We'll give a round of applause for them. I don't even know what to say about them, so I'll just leave it. <laughs> they did a great job. Um, while we're doing shout outs, I also want to um, thank somebody who I often forget to thank, but is our integral parts of our program, and that is Cheryl and Willie, who are our bus drivers. <laughs> So thank you to you guys, for sure. Um, let's see. I also, while we're thanking people, I'd like to thank a huge, huge, huge thank you to all of the mentors, especially those in the audience today, but all of the mentors for taking on the role of an intern for the summer, a college first intern for the summer. It takes a lot of time to teach somebody what you do and give them direction and really have them understand what's going on and they work with the kids to make sure they're really doing meaningful work and the program just wouldn't be what it is without you, it would basically be a class. So I want to give a really big thank you to all of the college <laughs> And of course we couldn't do what we do without the money to do it. Um, so we are hugely indebted to our donors. Thank you very much to all of the people and foundations and agencies who fund this program. Okay, so we have two main presentations to get going for you for College First. Um, our first is something totally different. Um, is for you guys who regularly come year after year, you know usually the students are up here presenting a research project. They're showing you graphs and hypotheses and results and conclusions and a typical science research project, which are always amazing. But this summer, because of our really shortened schedule, we weren't able to do that. 
So we came up with an alternate idea, um, which was to have the students concentrate on really understanding the big picture of the research that they're assisting with, and to understand you know, how it fits into science being done all over the world, and what is the impact of it, and why is the mentor studying this particular plant, um, or whatever the case may be. Um, and then also how to explain what they do here every day. So this is an amazing opportunity, but if people aren't able to explain it on a college application essay or a resume, it can't get them as far as it otherwise might have. So we focused on that by doing a totally creative and kind of crazy project, um, which was to create an online interactive graphic novel set in various points of the future and the present. Um, we talk a lot, I'm just gonna show it so that you guys can get a feel rather than try to explain it. But half the students worked on creating that story, um, which was a big project in itself, and researching the science behind it that would make it believable. The other half of the students who worked in the research lab worked on writing a science journalism piece. Um, so really trying to explain the research but more in a popular and accessible style for the general public. We're gonna present both those things. Um, the comic is a huge technical undertaking, uh, so it's not quite complete yet, but we're on our way. So I'm going to show you three pages from the comic, and then after that, the students who did journalism pieces um, will get up and share their articles with you. I'm going to give you an idea, though, of what, how those two pieces are integrated in the final project. So. So this is an example of one of the pages from the comic, um, and you'll get an idea what it's about in a minute. But just to show you that embedded within the comic are these sort of glowing orbs. Um, and when you click on those orbs, then students' um, articles come up at a point in the comic story where they're relevant. So. Isabel was doing research on orchids this summer, and so this is her article on orchids. Um, so that's the way the comic's going to work, and we're going to give you just a taste of it now. So if I could have those four students and Isabel come up now. A little background, the two main um, characters in our story are Dakota North, the fictional character and heroine, and Hugh modeled after a certain other Hugh, uh, who in this story plays a CBG scientist, unlike you really. Um, hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Our story begins at the end, although it is also far in the future. Our hero, Dakota West, is one of the last remaining humans after an unknown disease has has decimated the population, and an ecological collapse has destroyed nearly all plants and animal species. Unlocking an ancient seed vault is their only hope for growing a medicine. When her sister falls ill, Dakota decides to use a dangerous time transfer device to travel back in time to find the genetic key which keeps the seed vault closed. <coughs> Our story opens with Dakota wandering through a desert landscape. After traveling through this past world, Dakota finds an object she believes to be the genetic key. When she attempts to return to her time to unlock the seed vault, the machine malfunctions and the seed and sends her further back in time. Nothing like getting a great sample. 
I can't wait to blend this dirt up. Ah, the soothing noise of the ball, ball mill. Even after a good day at work, I wonder sometimes if it's enough. Some days it seems like for every step towards better conservation, there is dire news about the environment. It terrifies me that my grandchildren might not see all the plants I do. And as lovely as plants are to look at, it will be even worse if they aren't around to do their job in balancing our ecosystem and providing food and medicines. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> the transport device should have returned Dakota to our time in the future. Instead, it has sent her someplace else. What? You just appeared. You shouldn't jump out like that in front of a moving motor vehicle. I know this car doesn't look like much, but that doesn't mean it should be taken lightly. With only enough power for two uses before being powered up again, the transport device is useless. Time is running out. Why is the transport device malfunctioning? Please, I don't know who you are, but I need your help. I need you to fix my time transporter device. Without it, we are all doomed. But I, I thought the machine could only take me to places that were suffering a catastrophe, and this place looks amazing. I've never seen anything like it. That's very nice. But shouldn't you be getting back to college first now? I'm afraid that I'm very busy testing some soil samples, and I don't have time for games. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. The device has video stored of the world as it is in my time, ruined and in hospital. Have you heard of a high emissions scenario? It's an ancient prediction about what would happen if all the coal reserves were burned. Well, they were. The temperature rose only by a few degrees, but it was enough. Glaciers melted, the sea rose, and our geography was changed forever. People were forced to move inland. What once was cropland now needed to support our population. But when the climate changed, many species couldn't adapt quickly enough. Some died quickly. Others took longer, but when their food source dried up, they died too. Soon we were left with only a few viable crops. And all the upheaval and severe weather crisis, science and ecology slowed to a halt. Many years in the future, the lifespan of humans is shrinking. We are dying younger and younger, and we don't know why. Our last hope is to recultivate the plants of our world, hoping that we can begin the restoration process. A seed vault is the last remaining source, resource we have, but it's been lost. I'm using our time transporter to find the gene key. So that's why I'm here, and I need you to help me find the key. <laughs> Good story. I certainly hope that never happens. Did you write it as part of the college first assignment? <laughs> it turns out that Dakota has the wrong key. They go back to the device and try once more. Hugh is able to decipher ancient text on the de device which leads them down the wrong path again. Once again, the device sends them unexpectedly to Heath's time. After finding and rejecting several potential genetic keys, Heath realizes the genetic key is not a destructive species, but a human being. When Dakota realizes this, she understands that to unlock the sea vault, Heath must come with her permanently to, her, to the future. However, she realizes that the physics of such a scenario would destroy both of their timelines. What's this? The drawing is disintegrating. Wait. That could only happen if Dakota never came here at all. That could only happen if something changes, and the future she lives in is different, and she never has to come back in time. But the only thing we changed was me. I'm the only one who spoke with her, who saw her world. I'm the only one who knows for sure what's coming. Dakota, Dakota takes matters into her own hands and returns to the future. If Hugh is able to prevent the high emission scenario from occurring, then Dakota might not be born in a, into a desolate wa wasteland. Realizing this, Hugh feels a sense of renewed urgency and decides to dedicate himself to educating the world about the importance of environmental science and stewardship. Yeah. <laughs> Soil Labs this summer with my mentors uh, Jarrell and Anne, they're back there, and I was studying orchids, um, uh, one specific orchid in particular, the white lily slipper orchid, which is native to Illinois prairies, and I learned a lot of stuff about orchids this summer from like my mentors and reading about them, 
And some like really cool things about orchids is, well, I didn't know that vanilla comes from orchids. Like, how many people like vanilla? Everyone? Yeah, pretty much everyone. So <laughs> that's pretty that's pretty great. And I've also like orchids are part of like ancient history. My mentors told me that samurais in Japan would carry them into battle, and they're just a really interesting plant. Um, so basically, every day um, I kind of. Most days I'd start out with uh, working in the dirty lab, which is where we handle all the soil samples and stuff like that. And I would work with the ball mill, which grinds up soil samples into a really fine powder. And um, as you saw in the comic, <laughs> Hugh is so, uh, grinding up soil samples in the ball mill, and it's like a very loud kind of grinding noise, which is really interesting. I think I can play it. Brace yourselves. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. Well, never mind. <laughs> um, yeah, um, that was that was really cool. I also did. Um, I prepared slides of root tissue. Um, I made dirt smoothies and took the pH of a bunch of soil samples. There's like hundreds of soil samples. It's, you have to be really thorough with that kind of stuff. And basically, the whole, whole point of the project was to try and understand some of, understand the relationship with, between orchids and mycorrhizal fungi. Um, lots of plants have fungi in their roots, um, but orchids are kind of special in that they are very particular about their environment, um, and they're also threatened in the Illinois area. Well, the native plants are threatened in Illinois. So it's really important to know like what kinds of things are necessary for orchids to grow in restorations. So if you're trying to do a restoration and you want to plant orchids, you need to know like how if the soil needs to be inoculated with fungi and if the plant needs fungi all the time or if it only needs it in its growing stages or early life. And there's just a big knowledge gap in that field. So it was really cool to work with it this year. And um, so basically, orchids are endangered because they're, they're, they need a very particular environment. And um, I also learned that poaching is a big problem. Um, because people see a pretty flower and they want to take it home and then they can't grow them at home because they don't know exactly what they need. So, you know, if you're out in wildlife, just leave it there and uh, enjoy it. And if you want to get involved in conservation, you can volunteer for projects and stuff like that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Or afternoon, or later. Um, for me, the title of my project is Fungus Among Us. And during my week at the Chicago Botanic Garden, I've been working with both Ben and Kevin, as they are back there in the middle. And so what I helped them do was find a relationship between fungi and plants located in Yucatan Peninsula. We chose Yucatan Peninsula simply because it has two types of seasons, where one where it's just completely wet and another one where it's completely dry. So that season where it's completely dry, it's kind of incredible how the plants continue to grow even through that dry season. And we wanted to know what the fungi was doing, what type of nutrients was it giving this type of soil that was located at Yucatan Peninsula in order for it to grow efficient, in order for the plants to be alive and well and healthy. So I actually had two parts. The first part's more um, convoluted, if you will. The first part was there were approximately 96 soil samples. And we had to measure each soil sample approximately one gram and put them all individually into a glass tube. The next step was, of course, something what Isabel alluded to earlier, was to take each of these 96 soil samples and put them into the ball metal machine until they became a fine powder. Once that was complete, we took them to the third machine, which was a legal machine, which is, in other words, the centerpiece of the whole project. Because there we was able to see how much carbon and nitrogen was located inside of the soil. If we were able to see how much carbon and nitrogen that was inside of the soil, we was able to determine what the fungi was doing, what type of nutrients was giving that soil in order for that plant to survive and thrive on. Now the second part was something that more Ben and Kevin worked on earlier, which is where they collected over 210 plant samples from the Yucatan Peninsula and individually extracted the DNA from them. So there you can see a bigger picture. 
where now as we identify the plant by its DNA, we're able to know what type of soil that it associates itself with, and then from there on, we're able to see what the fungi is doing there. A lot of people think fungi is just some type of mushroom that goes in your backyard, or it's smelly, or it's disgusting, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not really the case. One of the things that people don't really realize is that fungi are what? Decomposers. They're able to take any living thing that is deceased and they're able to deprive it from all of its carbon or any type of nutrients that are there and they're able for the environment to reuse it again and again and again. So fungi is not just some simple type of mushroom, if you will. And so if you feel any, if you feel a great interest into doing this, I would urge if you're interested, like after this whole presentation, go ask Ben and Kevin even more research on this. Trust me, this was an awesome research project. Um, you go in your local library and look up more about fungi, and that was my project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Freddie Weichman. Um, this is my first year as a college first student. Um, I chose a job as a seed depositor. And as a seed depositor, I clean seeds, um, deposit seeds, and test if seeds are viable. Now, my uh, mentor and I was Dave Sonberger. Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, my mentor and I clean seeds, get rid of the shaft, which is the like uh, branches and leaves. Then we deposit the seeds into the vaults, which is like negative 20 degrees. Then uh, after a couple of years, we tested the seeds are viable. If they do not germinate, we get rid of the seeds from the vault, for they are useless to us. Um, now the seeds come from, is from the Midwest, uh, from many different collectors, different collectors. Um, now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And now the uh, now the, the Chicago Chicago Tag Garden is involved in the project with Q, the Royal Tag Garden at England. Now this project is to collect the seeds around the world that who volunteered to collect useful seeds. Useful seeds are like that gives, provides us food, oxygen, and like medication for us. Um, and just ignoring these useful plants this is insanity. <laughs> for, for plants are our future. <laughs> now, if you want to help out um, clean seeds, there's or organizations out there that you can help out clean seeds. <laughs> Thank you. alongside my mentor Christopher Wright and what I do in there is I take ArcGIS tutorials and I help out Chris with his Plants of Concern project. GIS stands for Geographical Information Systems and it is a mapping system that's online and what's really good about GIS is that when the landscape changes you can change the map along with the landscape versus a paper map which you would have to remake and print it back out. And he's using the GIS for his Plants of Concern project. Now, Plants of Concern are plants that are either threatened, endangered, or extirpated. And extirpated means that it's gone from that specific area. And he's looking at Plants of Concern in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. And the main focus he's looking at is the hills thistle and the woolly milkweed. And those two plants he focuses in on because they are gravel hill prairie species, which are very unique type of prairies formed by glaciation. And also because prairies, they're pretty much gone in the United States, there's only 0.1% of prairies left over. And looking at these plants is important because these plants are parts of larger food chains which affect us because animals eat these plants and the animals that we eat, if the plant that they eat is gone, they'll be gone, they will lose food. And also because they might be able to give us medicine or if they're gone, they'll leave room for invasives to come in and choke up the other plants around it. Thank you. My name is Erica Rocha, and I am. This is my first year in college first, and it's been a good experience. And 
I go to Lansdale College Prep High School. And today I will be talking about um, what I did over the summer. And that was uh, soil carbon sequestration by fungus. And as you saw in the graphic novel that we did, uh, the main character, uh, Dakota, was struggling against uh, really hot temperatures. And that's really similar to what's happening right now. We're having a huge problem with global climate change. And something that contributes to that climate change is carbon dioxide. And today there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at any other point in the, in the last 800,000 years. And that's approximately like three trillion <coughs> tons of CO2 that are that is in the air and it contributes a lot to the global climate change to increase the temperature and I worked with I worked with Louise and Katie who are scientists here at the Chicago Botanic Garden to help them to determine how fungi uh, contribute to carbon sequestration and the global carbon cycle and to do so, I worked with Allison, that's sitting right there. <laughs> and what we did was harvest the fungi in the prairie that was planted in the garden. And we would take that back to the lab and we grind them up into a very fine powder, which would Allison, she would then take it to the Northwestern lab for analysis. And we also grew new cultures of fungus um, with by putting them into a solution called triptych broys soy broth, and that is a nutrient that would help it help it grow. And fungus is really important in soil because it it's really good at degrading things, and. It can break down components in the soil. And a large portion of carbon, of the global carbon flow, is processed by, by fungi. But little is known about how it's transformed or metabolized or how it's stored in organic um, matter. By studying the ability to, by studying the fungus's ability to degrade um, and remove carbon from the atmosphere. It's important because there's already a lot of carbon dioxide in the air, and it contributes to the climate change. And it will allow us to see whether, how much, or how it does it, how fungi removes um, carbon from the air. And if you would like to learn ways to reduce your own carbon dioxide emission, or you could look into your own carbon footprint, which is the amount of carbon a single person releases into the atmosphere each year, and ways to reduce that. Thank you. Hi guys, my name is Jocelyn Ramirez, and today I'll be presenting my time here at the Chicago Botanic Garden. This is my second year doing college first, by the way. Um, well, there's some things La, uh, La Urbana Venezuela, Para Brazil, Manabi, Ecuador, and French Guinea share something in common. They all are locations where a species of lichen called Cinemetra are. This past uh, five weeks, I've been spending here at the garden. We've been doing stuff such as PCR, which simply is getting DNA samples and sequencing them again and again and finding certain segments of it. Also, um, I've been working with GIS, which stands for Global uh, geographic information systems and it's pretty cool because they're computerized maps and you get to change them when the environment changes and you get to put like wherever those species is found that's where you find them uh, I would like to quote my mentor Alex uh, he said if we don't know if it's out there how would we know how to conserve it I found that really important because environmental scientists pretty much find a species of plants or animals and what they're trying to do is figure out why they're endemic or why they're going extinct in a certain area, and that's pretty important, I think. So for um, environmental scientists could pretty much educate people like us and we could conserve 
endemic species. And that concludes my Testing seed viability is important because if we lose 
uh, the prairies. Animals lose their habitat. If the prairies die, the pollinators die, and it's a chain reaction. And it's gonna affect everybody. It disturbs the whole ecosystem, not just that specific area. Um, the way I tested the seed viability was there were <laughs> there were uh, I tested them through there was a tetrazoleum test which uh, you soak them in tetrazoleum and the embryo would turn a bright red color if it was viable. Uh, we also did germination tests which would we we would plant them like in little petri dishes and check to see if they grew or we did an x-ray method, which you just x-rayed them and you can tell like if the embryo was complete, if it was viable. And that was pretty much it. Hi guys, I'm Jenna Washington. I worked in the soil lab this summer with my mentors Lauren, Ben, and Mariah. They're back there. So, my mentor Lauren's project has to do with soil and how underground processes in the soil can affect above ground plants and vegetation. So, um, it was really exciting going into the lab every day. I never knew exactly what I was going to do. We did a variety of things from sorting through samples of soil and litter, and I mounted some cool um, hyphae on slides and looked at them under the microscope. And um, we also went out into the um, into the field, which is there's a picture of it right there. Um, in the back, it's like this really tall. Um, wall of buckthorn is really dense. They're really vicious plants. And we um, went out to that site and we cut down the buckthorn. And she's been working on that site for five years. So the front area, the restored area, is the prairie. It's taken a long time. It's starting to look really pretty. There are a few spots where there's some buck buckthorn that came up. And we went back out there and cut them down, and we had to make huge piles of buffalo, which will later be burned. And yeah, so buckthorns are an invasive species. They grow um, really dense, and they take over everything. So not a lot of plants can grow around your buckthorn, so you want to not have it in your garden. Um, so if you do want to go home and try to see what invasive species are in your yards, I would recommend getting rid of the invasive species. There's pretty of natural, natural plants that you can substitute for them because they are a hassle and they take a lot of the nutrients that your other plants would need. And um, yeah, come visit the soil lab. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. It's in the Plan Science Center, and you guys can see it through the glass. And all the science first kids that are going to do college first next year, I highly rec recommend the soil lab. It's really awesome. You should choose that. <laughs> <laughs> first interns did while we were in Michigan with you. Um, so every day we would go, well not every day, but for two days we went out into the forest and there were three sites, site A, site B, and site C. And while we were there, we were, there, we were pretty much just identifying vegetation and um, IDing trees and measuring trees. Um, the square you see there in that picture is called a quadrat and it was a meter by a meter. And we would um, lay this quadrat down and ID all the vegetation in it and the amount of coverage within the quadrat to see um, how much of each species was there. 
Um, Michigan mosquitoes are way worse than Chicago mosquitoes. <laughs> and I only say that because while we were in the forest, it, it was terrible, but it was a really fun learning experience. Um, I know I personally learned um, a lot of scientific names for trees, and I, I really enjoyed that. We, if we could not ID the species on the spot while we were in the forest, we would take it back and ID it in the classroom. And we put all of this information from the three sites into a spreadsheet, and we calculated um, floristic quality index, which is pretty much used to um, find, like, see the quality of the natural area that we were in. We also looked at the old state of each site, what it was used for, whether that was past or was it previously forest. We took soil samples, which is where Hugh comes in, and we took um, tree, the core samples from trees to see how old some trees were. Um, I think everyone really enjoyed it, but we were told that we would be doing lab research, so it was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> Overall, it was a really fun experience. So, thank you. Okay, so I forgot to give a huge important thank you. Um, and that's to the College for Students themselves. I think you guys saw from... <laughs> the quality of those presentations, which by the way, were not practiced at all. <laughs> that just, I don't know, I really think this was the best group of students since I've been here. This is my third summer. I've been amazed by them since we took off on that Michigan trip, even before that, actually. Um, the teachers agree. I think that you guys have done such a fantastic, amazing job, and we're really proud of you. Okay, so we're going to take a super, super quick break just while we set up the next project, like two, three minutes, um, uh, and you'll get an idea of what the next project is about, okay? So, a couple minutes. All right.